apenas. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. And make sure my mic's on here. Yep. Hope everybody's doing well. Week nine, business 635. You know, you guys are, should be honored. <clears throat> You're the last official or unofficial 635 class in the history of the University of Laverne. Because next fall, we're going to a new program for MBA experienced professionals, which you all are. And the 635 class has been um, changed a little bit and it's gonna be called 630. You are the last class in the history of University of Laverne and this class, I looked it up, has been taught for 22 years and you're the last class. That's something to be honored for. The 630 class for the fall is basically the similar class, but it's incorporating a little bit more accounting to it. And I'm sure a lot of you are great, like, like the, glad you're not taking up that class, a little bit more accounting to it. But this class is the last 635 class in the history of Laverne. Joey, don't worry about your camera, buddy. That's okay. As long as you can hear me, that's what counts. So just so that's a little bit of trivia for you all. You're the last 635 class in the history of the College of Business for the University of Laverne. Now, tonight is our last official class. We will have class next week on Monday night, but it's strictly voluntary. You can come if you want to, or you can watch it on the review. Uh, but I'm going to give you uh, next Monday as a volunteer class. I'm going to be here at 6 o'clock. I'll have the same dopey looking shirt on. I'll have the hockey game in the background or the baseball game in the background because I'm done with watching finance for the day. And so uh, I'll still be here. Uh, but uh, you uh, are volunteer. Uh, I'm going to be next week reviewing case number four. I'm going to be posting the grades by Wednesday of this week. So you can go into the uh, electrics case knowing exactly what your grade average is. I'm also going to post the class participation segment exactly. of our grade on Wednesday as well. So all of the grades will be posted heading into the last week. All you have left is the electrics case. So you can see what your grade average is coming into the final week and see where you stand. So everything will be posted by Wednesday so you can take a look at that. If any of you have questions or concerns about that grade point average, be sure to let me know. Now's the time to do that this week. So as I was saying earlier, um, we have an, a volunteer class next Monday night. I'll be reviewing case number four and also reviewing any final electrics questions you may have. We also, this Saturday morning, have a review session via Zoom at 10 o'clock this Saturday morning. For any of you adventurous students who wanna get up and uh, enjoy 635 with some questions, you're more than welcome Saturday morning. I will be here to answer any questions concerning the electrics case as well, all right? So we have next, uh, this Saturday at 10 o'clock, a Zoom session, which I will re be recording. We have a voluntary class next Monday evening at six o'clock, which I will be recording. And then you have your electrics case, which is due to be posted to Blackboard on Sunday, August 16th. I will post the final grades for this class if everything is posted by you by Wednesday, August 19th. You will have your course grades. That's if you complete your course evaluation. You complete the course evaluation by Tuesday the 18th. I will post your grade on Wednesday. 
You don't have to do an evaluation. It has nothing to do with your grade. It has nothing to do with the outcome of the course. All it is is an anonymous evaluation of this course. And I don't want to, I want to say it again, anonymous. Nobody knows who submitted it and who the student is. It has nothing to do. I don't get these evaluations until about three months after the class. So if you post your course evaluation, I will release your grade to Blackboard on the 19th. If you don't and de desire not to post your grade, which is okay, it's a free country, you'll have to wait for the uh, registrar to post your course grade. If you go to Blackboard, you'll see your course grade blank. You'll see your electrics grade, you won't see your cumulative average in a percent, and you won't see your course grade. You'll just see all your grades throughout the term. Now, let me warn you in advance. Oh, well, I, I don't need that. I see all my course grades throughout the course. I can just total those up and find my course average and my grade. Well, you can do that, but beware, each one of these grades have a certain weight, percentage weight of your course grade. So if you don't, if you do not know the weight of the course grade, it's going to be very difficult for you to determine an accurate grade point percentage. See my bargaining chip? See how I work? If you complete your course evaluation, you don't have to worry about all this. You'll just get your grade. Okay. Course evaluations are important. They keep the program, hopefully, if the people read them properly, which I think they do. They maintain the integrity of the program. They maintain quality and efficiency. If you do not like a class, you do not like the professor, you do not like certain things about the class, do an evaluation. If you like the class, like the professor, like the material, do evaluation. It makes the program better and it makes it improving. Now it doesn't do you any good. Most a lot of you are going to be ending it, ending your program in about another six months or two terms. But it makes the quality of the program better and I think that's important. Okay. So that's the timeline of our class over the next week. All right. Monday's August 10th class is optional. Saturday's August 8th review session, optional. Grades, final grades posted Wednesday, August 19th. Any questions in this regard? Thank you. Couple one last comments on case number three, because this case will help you prepare if you not already have done so, which many of you have, because I've been getting some of your work for the electrics case. Remember the weighted average cost of capital is a combination of the weight of the debt position of the company to the weight of the equity position of the company and the cost of debt determined by the interest rate on the debt less the tax rate of the company and the cost of equity of the company determined by the capital asset pricing model, taking the risk of the company and relating it to market risk and the risk-free rate. That capital or working weighted average cost of capital number is your discount rate for your analysis. The analysis in, in um, case number three was to determine an investment of $400,000 of asset, an additional $175,000 of working capital in the initial year, zero, a $575,000 investment. What profit what return would they get 
measured by net present value, internal rate of return, profitability index, and payback in years. Dollars, percent, ratio, years. The variables given in the case allow you to determine the net income of the company as you're planned and the net cash flow, which is the bottom line for which you use your discounted cash flow analysis at the weighted average cost of capital. Couple key things that some of us missed. Make sure you're familiar with the inflation rate of whatever case you're doing. Inflations change from project to project. You have different inflation rate in the electrics case. In case number two, it was 2% for revenue, 2.5% for variable cost, and 2% for fixed costs. Make sure you're aware of, whoops, excuse me. Make sure you're aware of in the case of what the, if there's any salvage value. And if you're fully depreciating the asset over its life, the salvage value at the end of the life of the project would be determined by the gain on the sale of that asset. Thus, you have to pay tax on that salvage value, that additional cash and make sure you have adding back the working capital over the four years prior, including year zero, as a cash flow addition in the fifth year. Your analysis then goes to a risk analysis. We're taking a scenario of change in volume output at their weighted probabilities to determine a weighted net present value for the case based on three different alternatives. The usually the greatest percentage is your average or your base case. Then you have your worst case and your best case. Then you do an analysis by variable, altering some variables to the case based on the original base case. The original base case had $107,151 NPV. So when I'm doing the sensitivity analysis, that's my base for my profitability. That's where all three lines meet at 107,151. But then I alter each line by a change in that particular variable only, a 30% drop in selling price per unit a 30% increase in selling price per unit. You do these correctly, your line will be dead straight showing the sensitivity of the curve of the line of that variable. Variable cost per unit is the same, but now this is an expense. A 30% deduction in variable cost will give you more profit, whereas a 30% deduction in selling price will give you less profit. And another variable is to alter the weighted average cost of capital, which happens to be 5.95% in this analysis. That affects the discounted cash flow. And you get an analysis there. The key point of the sensitivity analysis compared to the scenario analysis, the scenario changes the output, the volume, the units sold and produced. The sensitivity takes at deltas of various variables in the case. I charted this to show the how the lines look. Revenue, variable cost, weighted average. The flatter the line, the less deviation in the dollar amounts. The steeper the line, the greater the deviation from minus 30 to 30. That's what you're tracking. The sensitivity is how one change can go as far down as this, and one change can go as far up as this, and such and such. This is called a risk analysis. The chart is especially effective 
if you're going to use put this into a paper. Or you can copy and paste the tables into the paper to show the highlighted of these risk analysis. But in your paper, I do not want to see whole spreadsheet numbers cut and pasted into your paper. Have a way of condensing and using those in a better format once you start writing your paper and answering those questions provided in the case. This was case number three and the grades and solutions have been posted last week. And then I ask you for some various evaluations of the numbers and you guys all did that very well. What do they mean in relationship to NPV, balanced scorecard and, and that sort of thing. And this is the solutions, there's different solutions, alternatives I gave, uh, there's the grading here. So there's different ways of looking at this. But I was more concerned about, yes, how you write these answers, but more concerned about making sure you're familiar with determining the information, and then you can go into the interpretation of your answers. Remember, two files need to be determined for the electrics case to be posted. A file showing your paper in APA format and a file showing your spreadsheet analysis with a variety of tabs. Tabs for each of the products, each of the analysis, and the, your calculation of weighted average cost. So I'm looking for two files, not five, not 10, two, each giving the information requested in the case. Now, an interesting thing about this case is a couple of things that are making you think a little bit. One is the warranty, and I think I covered that last week. Another is depreciation. There are mainly in the world of finance four depreciation calculations. You studied three of these in accounting. Straight line, units of production, and declining balance. Those are the accounting 101 ways of determining depreciation and those are used quite a bit in the real world. But also in the real world is the fourth one. And that's what you have in this case, the electrics case, marginal accelerated cost recovery system. Now, if you look up marginal accelerated cost recovery system on the IRS tables in your textbook in wherever, it gives you different classifications of assets. Three years, five years, seven years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and so on. Your job is to find the schedule, the asset classification that works with this case. Well, Mr. Hassey, I don't see eight years in the tables. They're there. Trust me, they're there. It, and that's all I'll say. So you are to take those percentages for each year and multiply it by the investment in your electrics case, and that's your depreciation schedule. And if you take all those percentages, you'll see that they total to 100%. And then you know you got it. You got the right schedule. And that depreciation will fully depreciate the asset over the life of the electrics products, eight years. That's one of the things you have to work out in setting up
this problem. Another thing you have to work out Hang on for a minute. Is making sure you account for each of the classifications of expenses given. Okay. Remember in this case, it's a little bit different. And what are the major differences? Well, first of all, Warranty, warranty. And also, some of you are having difficulties by some of the questions I'm getting. What's, I don't see variable costs listed in the case, Mr. Hasse. I don't see fixed costs listed in the case. Well, they're listed, they're just not listed under those names. You have to determine what are the variable costs and the fixed costs. Remember, variable costs are given on a per unit basis. The number of units you produce or sell times the variable cost rate is your expense. Fixed costs are a flat rate, not on per unit. So your job in this case is to determine what are the variable cost rates and what are the fixed cost amount. Also, you need to concern yourself with the controller. That's a variable cost as well. And the warranty cost. And as we indicated last week, you should probably keep, create a second line and call it variable cost warranty. Variable costs, variable cost warranty, and fixed costs. It'll keep it easier to do. Very important. And it's very important for one way that I cannot mention, but it's embodied in your analysis in the case. Make sure you keep, when you, if you're transferring one spreadsheet that you've worked on before to a new one, make sure you clean up. I don't want to see additional tabs for case overview, questions, clean it up. Also, clean it up as far as printing. If I want to print out your file, does it print out? Do, or do I get five pages of one spreadsheet all mangled together? Make sure you set it up that I can print it out very nicely and take a look at it. Thirdly, Make sure that you have no dollars in decimals and all your percentages and ratio and paybacks are in decimals to the hundredth decimal point. No dollar pennies, other numbers to the hundredth decimal point. Clean those up and make sure they're you got a nice professional. Just don't, at the end of the end, that's why I'm giving you so long to do this. At the end of your done, say, oh God, thank God this is over. I don't have to worry about this anymore. Here he is, Hassey, deal with it. No, 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 no. You'll get marked off points for presentation. If I can't read your numbers or I can't understand what you're doing, that's going to be trouble. So make sure you have the format that is professional. You should look at this when you're done and say, hmm, will the old man Hassey approve this? Does this look normal? If I go and hit my print preview, oh yeah, that looks good. Okay, that's printing out nice. See, it's all there, all on one page. I don't have to worry about it. So if he decides to print it out, he can see it. Cool. So just make sure you do that in putting together the final touches of your case. So again, there's different, uh, depreciation is the marginal accelerated cost. 
your job is to look that up and incorporate it in the project life that you have for this case. I'm looking for two files. One is in Word doc or PDF format of your actual paper. And the other is a spreadsheet format of all your analysis tabs for this case. And I think I mentioned it, I know I've mentioned this before, the entire work is due at midnight, August 16th. There's no uh, extensions available for this work. That's why I have a variety of re review sessions set up because as you start putting this together, if you're running into roadblocks, I have a review session Saturday, next Monday, and our office hours on Wednesday plenty of time to check in and make sure uh, if you have any issues or concerns. Remember, I'm not only looking for you crunching numbers, I'm looking for the quality of the presentation and the quality of the writing. At this level of study, that is very important. Okay. Any questions concerning the electric case as of August 3rd, 2020? Okay. I will see you, some of you, maybe on Saturday afternoon or Saturday morning. I will see some of you next Monday. I will see some of you in our office hours this coming Wednesday or next Wednesday. Plenty of opportunities, but a word of warning. Don't feel you can send me an email on Saturday, August 15th at six o'clock in the evening and get a quick reply. First of all, I will be here, but I'm gonna make you sweat a little bit because of that late hour, that doesn't show much planning. <laughs> much. Yes, I do know you guys all work. I do know you guys all have different schedules. I understand that. But also, you have plenty of opportunities. There's no more graded work to be done. So you allocate some time and kick out a spreadsheet. Do the timeline that we talked about. You're in good shape. Okay. That'd be good. Okay. Good. Let's move on. Short class tonight, by the way, guys, short class. So case three is there, we've reviewed that. Case four, uh, case four you've posted tonight in the, some interpretation of uh, alternative capital strategies and, and uh, trying to uh, ask you some questions about your interpretation of this sort of things. Uh, I've already looked at some of them and they look pretty good to me. So you guys so far have done good and I'll get all those grades together by Wednesday. Um, a couple of last thing, last things <clears throat> in that regard. Excuse me. Here's a little poll that we usually do these polls at break time, but I'm gonna to try to get us all done by break time tonight and go home. So here's a little poll I'd like you all to take a look at. All of the following, this leads into my lecture tonight, that's why. All of the following are alternatives for capital financing, but all of these are ways of getting capital for a company, but one, which one would that be? Initial public offering of stock, issuance of bonds, venture capital, chapter seven, liquidation, chapter 11, restructuring, profits, merger. What of these seven terms was, is not capital financing? 
See what you come up with. One minute. Okay, the uh, results are in. Uh, initial public offering of stock. That is a capital financing vehicle. You're selling shares of stock to the market through an investment banker obtaining capital. Issuance of bonds. You're issuing credit debt to the market through an investment banker obtaining capital. Venture capital. You're going on Shark Tank. You're going to private equity firms and issue, getting private financing, but you're getting capital. Chapter 11 restructuring. You're going to chapter 11 restructuring and allowing to restructure your debt and equity positions to restructure the company through additional capital financing. That form of bankruptcy, you're restructuring your assets and obtaining additional capital when you come out of chapter 11. Profits, naturally, you make money. Those profits are capital that you can either distribute to the shareholders at dividends or maintain in your retained earnings as investment in additional research and development, or just stash the cash for future times. A merger. You merge a company to find a restructuring of assets and debt, which creates additional capital. The one item that does not fit into this scenario is chapter seven, liquidation. For the investors, that is an alternative to capital financing because they're gonna try to get paid whatever's left after you sell off the assets of a company. When you chapter seven liquidation, you sell off the assets and the holdings, pay off the debt and whatever is left over, probably not much, goes to the stockholders of the company as a cash distribution. But for the company, Liquidation is not a form of capital financing because there is no more company. It's gone, fini. You are now closing operations. So of all these, chapter seven liquidation is not a form of capital financing. Chapter 11, that's kind of a fine line, but it's true. Chapter 11, you're restructuring the company to get additional capital by changing your debt position 
changing your equity position, restructuring the company to come out of bankruptcy, a new business. But chapter seven is you're not coming out of anything. You're closing the doors and selling off the assets. No capital being available to the company anymore because the company is no longer. Okay, and that's, that's kind of the last part of our course. And that was one of the questions on the quiz number four. And I'll talk about that next week when we take a look at that in, the, in our optional class on Monday, is you have a decision of as an investor, as a manager of a business, should what should I do? Should I declare bankruptcy and liquidate? Should I declare bankruptcy and restructure and try to come out of that with a, a new company? That was one of the questions on case number four. By looking at the data involved there, is it worth, worth restructuring? Or we should just say, all right, white flag, I'm done. And all the rest of these are, are natural. You read about them every day in the newspaper or on the news. Issuing stock, borrowing money, going on Shark Tank, coming out of Chapter 11, making profits, and merger. One of the big mysteries in the economy right now is on the whole, the Dow Jones Industrial Index, the 30 companies that make up the Dow in their corporate earnings for the second quarter of this year, on average, they went down 40%. The GDP of our company, of our country is down 32% for the second quarter. There's not much capital being raised out there. So uh, that's a problem. That's a problem in our economy. I came from a meeting today of some business associates uh, that are trying to take advantage of this and buying up cheap assets and, risk and taking those assets and creating a new company. Buying up cheap assets of companies that are up for sale or are in bankruptcy and try to recreate those into a new business. If you got the cash to invest in that, now is a pretty good time to do that because assets are cheap in value. You can get them for a, so a song and dance because companies have to sell out, take, sell off some assets to generate capital because they're not making that in profits these days. On Friday of this week, the unemployment numbers are coming out for July. What are those gonna look like? Are the consumers still out of work? By hopefully Friday of this week, our distinguished senators and Congress representative, congressional representatives, hopefully will come out with a plan to help our citizens with unemployment insurance and some cash flow while we get this economy back rolling again. So there's a lot of stagnation and not much capital out there now in the market. It's all, everybody's either, everybody who has it, they're hanging on to it and looking for deals. Everybody who doesn't have it is just struggling to save, sur survive their own little, their worlds. I live in a community here in Claremont, in West Claremont, where uh, a lot of people have invested in this community and rent them out, rent out the buildings to people. I don't do that here, I just live here. But this past weekend, an interesting thing occurred in my little area here of West Claremont. There are, I saw at least five or six moving trucks. <laughs> and that's not funny. People were moving out because they no longer can afford the rent of these buildings here in West Claremont. So they were moving out. They couldn't afford the rent for August. So they probably, hopefully, found another place to move to. And that's one of the big problems in the economy right now. A lot of people don't have much cash flow. And that's a big issue. So if I'm running a business, I'm thinking about investing in capital dollars or trying to re refinance my company. That's a big deal right now. And what vehicle is the most popular now of all these seven listed here? You're seeing a lot of retail companies going chapter 11, restructuring. That's their last chance. Banks will no longer give them money. Mark Cuban on Shark Tank are staying away from them. 
they're not making any profits. Revenues are down 40%. Mergers, why do I want to merge with a company that's losing money? Issuing public stock, who would want to invest in a company now that's not doing very good? The issuance of bonds or credit or debt, too risky. They might default. Chapter 11 now in the third quarter of this year is one of the most influential and attractive ways of financing a company, restructuring, taking a time out and restructuring. That's huge, big time. That's very important. It's very imp not very imp not so much important for you and I, we just wanna keep working and maintain our income. But for companies trying to compete in the market today, cash flow and capital is the key to keeping them going and developing their markets and their products. Without that, it's trouble. And you're seeing a lot of companies, especially in the retail industry, and I bet you're gonna see in the next quarter some banks beginning to fail. They'll keep that quiet. And some maybe some manufacturing companies beginning to fail. I see Ford Motor Company on the horizon looking at some restructuring. So there's a lot of things going on in the economy now that as students of finance and as an MBA, you look for those things in companies you wanna do business with, the company you're working for, the company you wanna invest in, how are they funding their operations? If they're making not much money and losing money, where is the capital coming in to meet their payroll, but at the same time encourage growth so they can compete? Last week, the CEOs of Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Twitter, I think it was Twitter, all were called into the Congress to the Congress to answer this one question. You guys are getting too big. You're swallowing up the competition. There's no capital left for anybody else. Either you do something about that or we're going to do some antitrust, some anti-monopoly issues with you. As public servants of the country, we can break you guys up. We, are, we can do that, we have that power. You better do something about this because you guys are getting too big. Amazon has 47% of the cloud market in the world. Huh? They control half the information in the sky. Now it's not really in the sky, it's in warehouses in Cucamonga. It's in warehouses in Northern California. It's in warehouses in Las Vegas. It's in warehouses in St. Louis. That's where it is. That's the cloud. It's where all these machines are working 24 seven, gathering all the data and running their business, selling it, marketing it. And they, they're getting too big. And that is a concern in the government. Now they're not gonna be touched now, but if Joe Biden becomes our next president, watch out Amazon and Apple somebody's gonna be going after you to make sure you're not gonna get any bigger. It's gonna be very interesting to see how that works out. But uh, that's a course or a time for another place. So, but these key things are what's important in alternative capital financing. Without the capital, just like, just think about last night, Sunday night, the first of the month was a very happy night in the Hassey house. That's when we pay our bills. <laughs> And I'm sure a lot of you in your own families did the same thing. August 2nd, Sunday night, it's time to pay bills. Now, when you get to be an old gangster like me, you don't have to write any rent checks. You don't have to write any mortgage checks. You don't have to write any. All I paid last night was credit card. That's all I paid. Now, that's because I'm an old gangster. Now, when I was 30 years old, Sunday nights were brutal. <laughs> oh, we're going to take the kids on vacation this month, but... I got to make the mortgage payment. I got to pay the car loan. Oh, we got to have food. Oh, and then I was dopey enough to send my kids to Catholic school and I had to pay for that. Sorry about that. 
all you Catholics out there, but they got a good education, but I had to pay for that, all right? Now, yes, I don't have any of those expenses, but as you guys all know, where's the capital to gonna fund <laughs> your life, your family? And if you don't have income or you have a le less income this time of year, or you have debt, that's going to pay a big influence on you managing your capital. And do you have alternatives to capital? I keep telling my students who graduate from the MBA program, when you graduate from the MBA program, you're not done yet. <laughs> don't, I don't, don't go back to school, I'm not saying that. But when you're done with the MBA program, now with an MBA, you have now a second source of income. You can teach. You can be a consultant. You can start a little business on the side. You can do so many more things because with an MBA degree, and then I know this counts, sounds kind of snobby, but it's the darn truth, people are going to listen to you. Oh, you're thinking about starting a business, huh? What's it going to be? Well, I got this idea, and then I'm going to do a little consulting. Really? How are you going to pay for it? Well, I'm going to put some of my own money into it, but once I show my business plan, I'm going to try to go out and get some capital. Oh, so you go to Wells Fargo. Hey, Wells Fargo. Oh, I need $10,000. I'm starting a little business. Really? Okay, show me your business plan. And by the way, do you have an MBA degree? Oh, yes, I do. Oh, okay. That, I know that sounds kind of snobby, but it's true. It helps. And it gives you a different alternative. And that's one of the reasons why you guys are going in hock or driving nuts about making your tuition payments to University of Laverne is because why? In the future, you are going to have alternatives available to you. Where Joe Schmo with a business degree, I'm not going to have. You can't go out and teach with a business degree. You can teach anywhere in the country with an MBA degree. Now, you can't become a full-time professor. That's when you got to get a, one of those knucklehead PhDs, which are worthless as far, as far as I'm concerned. Don't quote me on that. But with an MBA degree, you can teach anywhere. With an MBA degree, you can start a little business on the side. With an MBA degree, you can consult. With an MBA degree, you can do a lot more. You're expanding your ways of financing, capital, revenue sources. That's why you're sitting here with your cameras not on. <laughs> so again, a piece of advice. I'm thinking about starting a business. I got some good ideas. I work hard. I'm going to start a little company. You go into Bank of America. Here's your business plan. I need 10,000 bucks. I, as you can see in my business plan, I've incorporated that in my payback. Here you go. But then they're going to say, Hmm, do you have an MBA degree? I do. By the looks of this business plan, you've had HASI in finance. Your capital budget analysis is perfecto. You even did a scenario and sensitivity analysis. You need 10,000? Here's 15,000 with only an interest rate of 1%. Stephen, you'll say, thank you, Mr. HASI. I'm now on my way to another career. Now, that, ah, that is BS. But no, I'm serious. You are putting yourself in a position for additional capital finance. It's just like when a company like Best Buy needs capital. What's the first thing they're going to do is try to clean up their credit rating, clean up their balance sheet, make it more attractive to acquire capital. You with an MBA degree, I can't believe I'm, I'm sounding like an admissions officer. I apologize. But you with an MBA degree are making yourself more attractive in the market in your company. You know, you should go to your company and say, you know what, I have an MBA degree. Can I give some training sessions in our company? I could lead training sessions. Oh, really? Yeah. And then you say, then you write Mr. Hassey an email in about six months. Professor Hassey, could you give me a letter of recommendation? They're asking me to do this in this company. And they want, to, they want a, a letter from one of my professors. Sure, here you go. Joe did a good job. He got an A. He was in the top 5% of his class in MBA finance. He knows what he's doing. There you go. That's what you should do. That's the key to being successful, getting out of here. You should do that because you're giving yourself alternatives, different ways of going. If you don't want to do those alternatives, that's okay. 
that if you want choices, you are just like a mini company. You're giving yourself an opportunity to do that. So when you see companies, when you read the Wall Street Journal, you see companies looking for financing, they're going to have to restructure, re, redo their business model, clean up their credit rating, find additional revenue sources, lay off people, sorry to say, sell off assets. They're restructuring to make themselves more competitive, more value in the market. Alicia, Alba, who is the young man on your lap there? What's his this name? My, this is my son, Theo. Theo? Yes. How Hi, old is how old, how, Theo, how old are you? See? Two. Two years old. You're a big Theo. You're a big kid. Yeah, he's tall. <laughs> Theo, think about football in about 15 years, University of Laverne. We need you. We have, our, our defensive line is about five foot five and 170 pounds. It just ain't going to work. <laughs> uh, is, is Theo going to school this fall or is he still at home? No, he's still at home. Yeah, two years old. I, see, it's yeah, been a while since I've done this. <laughs> All, right. All right, Theo. All right, Theo, turn off your mic. That's enough of me being Captain All Kangaroo. Right. Get the hell out of here. <laughs> See you later. Bye-bye. Nice meeting you. All right. Uh, I crack myself up sometimes. Okay. So that's, uh, I'm, that's, that's, our, that's our topic for tonight. We're done. I wanted to go over the, that uh, interpretation of uh, alternative capital financing. I wanted to review case number three and the spreadsheet and go over the accelerated marginal accelerated cost recovery. Some students are having some difficulties with that. So I wanted to go over that. Remember, if you want to give me your WAC calculation for the electrics, you can send it to me. I'll let you know if you're on the right path. And uh, if you need help with the rest of the case, we'll be having a review session Saturday morning. And also next week in Monday's class, I'll be going over case number four, just so any of you have any questions about that, because here's a little tidbit. I can't believe I'm gonna say this, but I am. That answer you gave in question three of case number four, some degree of that can be used in your electrics case. There was a method to that madness. So think about that as you uh, look over your, the results of your case number four, and I can talk about that next week as well. See, I'm giving you tempting so you can come to class at least week, next week. Last, last term I did this and I had nobody, <laughs> absolutely nobody in class on that week 10. I still taught it and a lot of people looked at the video that it was a very lonely night staring into the abyss of the Zoom, all blackness. Alicia, does Theo have a brother or sister? No, he's an only child. Okay, so we need to get some capital financing to get that going again. Yes, after school, after I graduate. <laughs> okay, thank you, I'm teasing you. All right, Any? there's nothing else. Uh, let me just make sure I got everybody accounted for here. Um, Joey, I know your camera's not working, but I hope you've been able to hear all this. Elizabeth, you okay? You've been, uh, everything all right? There's Joey. Yes, thank you. Okay, you're okay. All right, then I'm going to uh, cease and desist this, uh, this class this evening. I probably will see some of you or a lot of you uh, in these last couple of weeks, but if I don't, Remember, as I gave you a little tip earlier, if any of you after, grad, after graduation or after this class is over, don't think that I don't give a RA about you guys, all right? Wendy knows this. If you want a letter of recommendation, I'm telling you, a letter of recommendation from a faculty member goes a long way for your resume and vita. Trust me. Um, and it doesn't have to be from Professor Hassey. It can be from anybody. But think about that. That is a good thing to have available, just to have it available, especially for work, promotions, everything. Geez, this guy knew what he was talking about in finance. It's good to know that. This is professors telling him this. This is good. So think about that down the road uh, as you get going. Also, I have a LinkedIn site that's very popular that I post a lot of stuff 
on about jobs, about careers, about a lot of things. So look up that LinkedIn site. I don't sell anything on this that I'm not, that that's done. I don't do any of that. It's just purely for information for you guys. It's developing your network. And that's what you all need to do. Develop that network out of MBA school to, to kick butt when you get outside. That's what you want to do. Develop that network. And this is the first start. All right. That's very important. So please keep in touch. Remember, I, when I've, some of you have heard this story, but I keep track of every student I've ever had. So if Wendy sends me an email in 10 years and I'm in my wheelchair drooling and I open up my email and Wendy says, hey, Professor Hassey, I'm, I'm thinking about starting my own company and I need some financing. First of all, can you help me? Second of all, I need a letter of recommendation for the bank. Could you do that? And I will remember Wendy. Probably it w I'll have to stop the drooling, but then I go to my spreadsheets because I keep a spreadsheet of every class I've ever taught and a master sheet of every student. Right now there's about 8,500 names on this sheet of what you took. Wendy, you're on the list already because you've had me. Everybody, every, what, your course, what you took, what your course grade was, Maybe some notes on Wednesday, Wendy, uh, Wendy's that says she doesn't know what she's doing. Stay away from her. But most of you, I put some nice little notes and, uh, and never rent an apartment from Wendy. I'll know that right now. So she's out of that business anyways. So, but all that sort of thing, I keep track because if you do need me for a recommendation, I'm not just going to write you some BS template of a, re of a recommendation. It'll be personal. And that's important. So think about that uh, down the road. That, just don't think about me, think about any professor. You have a professor that you have a, 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 a relationship with or you, you, you trust. Get to know that professor and say, you know, professor, could, would you mind writing me a recommendation letter? It'd be really important to my career. Every professor will do that. Even the mean ones will do that, trust me, because they like to do that. So remember that down the road. But I'll probably see all you guys within the next couple of weeks. All right. Adios. It's been a pleasure. See, I'm getting you out. You can go watch the Dodger game. They're playing Padres right now. You can go out. Paulina, you can have a, a little tequila. That'll be good, right, Paulina? No? Joey, I know you're a tequila man. You'll be into that. And so uh, let's uh, everybody have a great evening. And uh, we'll see you all uh, down the road. And I'll probably maybe see most of you next week. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you then. Bye, Theo. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Professor, I have a question before yes, we log off. Sorry. OK, so back to the depreciation calculations. Uh, yes, you mentioned. Okay, I wrote it down, but it was quick, and I know I could um, go back to the video, but we can find that on the IRS website. All you have to do, I'll go in, Elizabeth, and is just go into Google and type in MACRS tables. Uh, okay, I did that. I get a lot of things, so I'll do it again. I just want to pay attention. Yeah, and then you, can go, you can just go to, you can go, it'll, they'll probably give you some references to, you'll probably see the IRS come up, and you can do that. Okay. Uh, it's all, all you're consider. All you're going to look for is the class of asset and their schedule for what fits into our project. It's Perfect. going to be a little confusing, but that's why you're in MBA school to figure it out. Okay. Okay. All right. And if you Perfect. want to find it and then send it, tell me what you got. I'll let you know if you're on the right track. Okay. Right. And you said you just it's it's the percentage times the, the revenue, the no, investment no, percentage. No, okay. Right, right. Okay. Perfect. Okay. All right. You can just send Thank that to you. me just to double check later on. Okay. I will. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay.